from Boss Track, it's Her Hype Squad, a show about amazing women who've made incredible strides as leaders in their industry. They're here to support you and your leadership growth, to encourage you and hype you up as part of your Hype Squad. Hello, and welcome back to a new episode of Her Hype Squad with Boss Track. I'm your host, Michelle Harris. This week, I talk with Kia Miner about leadership lessons from the court, inspiring your team, building trust, and never giving up. Kia is a financial fitness coach whose goal is to serve and educate the communities that she's passionate about, those who must fight harder for their success. Her mission is to empower female professionals to improve their financial wellness, build generational wealth, and allow them to live, give, and enjoy their life with purpose and financial confidence. Prior to being a financial fitness coach, Kia spent six years as a Division III collegiate basketball coach. Basketball is still an important part of her life, and she now coaches club basketball. She places enormous value on character development, mentorship, and teamwork. If you enjoy my conversation with Kia, make sure you subscribe to our channel and help more people find us by sharing this episode with others or by leaving a review or subscribe to our weekly newsletter filled with things we found that we're excited about and were inspired by, along with valuable leadership advice to watch, listen to, or read. It's a little bit of joy for your inbox each Monday. You can subscribe at www.thebosstrack.com forward slash weekly joy. Now, without further delay, let's get into my conversation with Kia Miner. Hi, Kia. I'm so excited that we're finally getting a chance to talk. I know we've been planning this for a while, and I'm really looking forward to talking to you about your more unique perspective with um, your coaching experience and how that can apply to leadership. I'd love to start with maybe you giving a little background, telling the audience who, who you are. Yeah, uh, uh, and thank you for having me, Michelle. I'm so excited to be here. Um, Background on me. So right now, my title is I am a financial fitness coach. I also happen to be a podcast co-host. My co-host yells at me for not saying that more, so I'm I'm practicing saying that out loud. (laughs) I would have brought that up if you didn't. (laughs) (laughs) And that's why we love you, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I, I am super passionate about helping women succeed and, and achieve financial confidence and all of the simple and complex intricacies that come with that. And it's really been um, something that near and dear to my heart for the past two and a half, almost three years. Yeah. So we're just coming off of tax season. I'm guessing you don't do returns, but you do a lot of planning for taxes. Yes, 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 yes. The questions come rolling in once January comes around. And uh, like you said, even though I don't do taxes myself, I always try to keep a bucket of CPAs to just refer out to because, and, and in different states, because, and especially being an entrepreneur, you know, one minute you think, your taxes are simple. And the next minute you get, you know, you make a big sale or you make a big change and everything is, is turned upside down. So yeah. yes, definitely. Yeah. That is absolutely true. I can attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's been a year for a while that we've had a, a normal tax return. So I was just thinking about that this morning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So like I mentioned earlier, I'm really excited to dive into your coaching experience because what what we at Boss Track really promote is being a coaching leader. And when I talk about coaching, I don't mean somebody's doing something wrong and you're coaching them through that issue. It's more treating your team as if they were a sports team where you're the coach. And you're really relying on your team to, to, for success. And, you know, they all have a role to play and you are just the one to be there and kind of give them support and guidance and feedback as they need it. So I was never a coach myself, but I can assume that there are a lot of parallels to actually coaching and just to your background is women's college coaching. Yeah, I, I uh, before I was doing 
my financial fitness coaching, I was coaching women's college basketball for six years. And it was an amazing experience. And, and to your point, Michelle, there's so many things that you learn from being in the driver's seat and depending on the way in which you communicate and how much you can get them to buy into what you're saying. And then to see that play out on the court is just, uh, you know, even that is a puzzle piece, right? I'm sure you, it, it can be transferred right back into corporate, into, you know, a, a boardroom anywhere, right? If you're able to really convey a message and understand the players on your team, it's so much easier to achieve the goal that you're striving for. Yeah. So I'd love to start off on a very positive note. <laughs> Let's talk about inspiring and motivating your team. Can you give us a idea or tell us like with your teams, what did you do to inspire them and to motivate them to succeed? Yeah, I, I first, I always try to get to know them on an individual level because once you know what makes a person tick, it's easy to figure out how to motivate them if they're unmotivated or even, you know, figure out maybe not the what of what's wrong, but that something there is a problem or issue that exists. And then I'm I'm a very outgoing, outspoken person. So like anybody that was on staff with me would probably call me the rah-rah coach. Like I was always up on the bench and, you know, clapping around on, um, at practice. But I always, at the beginning of practice, I always had a ritual as they were doing their stretches. I'd, you know, check in with them. We'd have like, a. some of us had an individual handshake. Some of us, you know, would just, uh, dap each other up and I'd ask them, you know, what's, what's new? How was classes? What's going on? Like, what, what are you struggling with? How can I help you? But really, really, really understanding how to access them and, you know, their kids, right? They're adults, but their mm -hmm. kids at the same time. So that was my favorite part was it's tricky. Things change so quickly. Like what works for them one day, you may be like, no, nah, coach, that's old news, right? <laughs> so <laughs> definitely keep you on your toes as well. But I would have to say the their resilience was always what inspired me. I was a former college athlete as well, but it just feels different when you're on the other side of the bench and you're like, you don't realize when you're in it, how much you're carrying, how much you're juggling, like what it really takes to succeed while you're succeeding or lack thereof. But then being a coach, it's like, oh my God, like these kids are busting their butts. Like every day they come to practice, even when we're getting on them for not trying hard enough, it's like, they're actually trying really hard. We need more from them, but you know, it's not like they're just out here slumming it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd say for, for me, I know that's not technically your question, but I feel like it was important to note that um, seeing the way that the girls on my team were always showing up and always trying their hardest was like the reason why coaches coach, right? It's, that's just like the icing on the cake and the sprinkles and the, and everything else. <laughs> yeah. That's funny what you mentioned earlier. I was just imagining like you come in with your handshake and you know, the person, the, the girl, the girl is like, nah, what is that? Like, <laughs> you're right. Things do change so quickly. I mean, hope maybe not handshakes, but <laughs> I'm just so like and, new songs and new dances that like I, uh, dances. I can't keep up I can't keep up you guys have to keep me cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what is there a time or um, an individual specifically you can think about where they might have been having issues at school or with family and you were kind of seeing they were struggling and you had to motivate them in a particular way that you could share yeah, um, one that always sticks out to me, it actually wasn't on my college team. When I was coaching college, I would do in the off season, a bunch of camps that would have high school players getting ready to go to college or trying to get recruited in various parts of the country. And I was in a camp at the University of Maine a while back now, and I, I had just graduated 
I think I had just graduated my, so I just finished my first year of coaching in college and I was doing a, a summer camp with them. And this girl must have been no older than 15 or 16. And everybody was talking about how she was like the problem kid, you know, like she was all, she, she, she went there because her sister was there, but she didn't really have any interest in basketball. And because of that, she was always, you know, messing everybody else up, joking around and nobody could really get a hold of her. And since I was new to that camp, they were like, you got her, <laughs> like yeah. you figured it out because we don't know what to do with her. And so that was a challenge for me, which I, I love to be challenged. I said, okay, I'm going a, I'm to a get her in line. I don't know how I'm going to get her in line. We started to build a rapport and it was an overnight camp. So there was one night, like I had broken through the mold. She wasn't necessarily doing everything I was asking her to do, but she wasn't disrupting practice. So I, I was like, I'll take that, right? Like that's a big yeah. first step. And she'd come up and say hi to me at lunch, do different things. So I knew we were getting somewhere. And then the next day she was almost did a complete 180. Wasn't sure why, didn't know what happened and didn't really have enough time to, to check in with her because I still had to keep the, the practice going. And then later on that night, I saw her in the common room looking like very upset. I said, listen, you know, do you mind if I come sit down with you? She said, yeah. I said, you don't have to tell me what's going on. I just felt like, you know, you might need someone to be next to you. If you feel like talking, you can talk. If you don't want to talk, you don't have to talk, but just know I'm here for you. And as soon as I finished that statement, she just, the, the floodgates opened. Yeah. She just started letting everything go. She was so upset. She was like hyperventilating, crying. And I just, she asked if um, if I could hug her. I gave her a hug and I just yeah. sat there holding her for at least 10 minutes sobbing. It turned out that her, um, she had found out earlier that day that one of her best friends died wow. but she wasn't comfortable talking about it and she didn't feel like she had anybody that she could talk to about it and had I not noticed the change in her demeanor she probably would have held on to that for the rest of the week hopefully she had somebody at home that she could talk to about it but she still had a couple more days before she could get there so it was nice to be able to be there for her and it was nice to to know that I had done enough of the work beforehand for her to feel comfortable enough to share that moment with me because I mean we could have just sat there and hopefully that would have been good enough for her because it was good enough for me I felt like I was doing something but it was really really touching to be able to be there for her and you know we we kept in touch since mm -hmm. then she reached out to me maybe two years ago found me on Facebook and was like, I'll never forget that moment. And Aww. this is what I'm doing now. And I was just like, oh, like you just never know what little to you, what seems little to you could be so transformational to somebody else. And I, I always felt proud of that. You know, I, the teenager, sometimes you're like, yeah, and one ear out the other. So yeah, it's really nice to hear that it was, it, you know, it was kind of the same experience for her as well. No, oh, that's a such a emotional story. And yeah, I understand you have to feel so good about that. I'm wondering when you first started working with her, when they said, here, you handle her, like, was there something specific you did or you just really started talking to her to like start gaining her trust? I, I don't think I did anything specific. I'm sure if you asked the other coaches, I did. But I, I feel what very strongly about having a balance between being strict and, and being fun. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm always a very bubbly personality. You know, I, I, I'll make jokes. I crack jokes. Like a lot of times my, when I would come to a new team because of the way I, I, I say things like, for example, when you make a layup, I would call it finishing your breakfast. <laughs> And they'd be like, oh, what? So like, there's always these little like Kia-isms that takes a while, um, but I throw them in there because even if they don't get it, it sounds funny. But I'm also very, very, very strict about respect and expectations. And I think the balance, and, and I've heard from players and also parents that everybody's always appreciated it because there's space for both. There's space for you to be who you are, but there's also, you know, a boundary and a line drawn that, you know, you're going to get consequence if you step over it. And I think maybe that was the difference that everybody else was 
trying so hard to just get her in line without seeing her for who she was and and like she didn't like basketball right so that's one there she you know she doesn't like basketball then trying to get her to do everything basketball all the time is probably not going to work but you know that that's outside of the box thinking that you wouldn't necessarily go you're a basketball coach she's here to learn basketball why would we not be doing anything but that so um I guess now that I'm thinking about it, yes, I did something specific, <laughs> but at the time it just felt like, you know, you were moving through what made sense. Right. Right. Oh yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. And it definitely, I can hopefully as people hear our conversation, they can apply exactly what you're saying to working with their teams because it's so, so relevant. Mm-hmm. So speaking of the conversations and, and being strict, how do you handle, I can imagine like working with team teams, especially teenagers, young adults, there's going to be some conflict and you have difficult conversations. Like how did you approach conflict between your players when, when that existed? Yeah, I will say, I think some of my method is definitely unique sport related right because one of the things um I used to always say was you don't have to like her but you got to play with her on the court right and if we're talking about business that doesn't it kind of applies but yeah, I think it does yeah I think it's a little you know I, I in, in my experience I think it's easier to like shut shut it off when you're on the court yeah because it's, you know, it's such a, it's such a start and stop. Like it's a light switch where, you know, if you're dealing with somebody on your team, you're dealing with them for a much longer time. But to your point, Michelle, I do think it, I do think it applies. I I just think it can't hold as much weight if we're Mm -hmm. talking about it in a professional setting. Um, But that was always my, like one of my, my phrases and, 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 and cliches, like, you don't have to like her, but you have to figure out a way to play with her or you're not playing. Right. Because I'm not dealing with that on the court. Um, And then the other thing was. One, understanding that, like, especially with females, there's always going to be drama (laughs) and remembering like how big things felt to me at that age, even though (laughs) five, six years later, I was like, this is so dumb. (laughs) (laughs) But it feels huge. It feels, you know, world ending. And it was always before having a conversation with them, making sure that I could remember that because it's really easy to be condescending in situations like that and, and, and then add insult to injury. But then aside from that, we, it's may sound cheesy, but it was almost always a a conversation individually. And then if it was necessary, um, together with some sort of mediation very rarely did that need to happen because most of the time you know it was something like they felt like they they weren't being heard and they may have been taking it out on said person because they might have been playing more than them and they just needed to hear the things that they needed to do if they wanted to get more playing time but lots of communication and and I always wondered you know I would talk to my colleagues that coach men and say, do, is, like, do you guys do the same thing? And most of them would be like, no, we just let them fight it out and, and it's over by the next day. <laughs> but you know, as women, we're we're uniquely in the sense that we're communicators and we like to be able to feel heard and, and feel seen. And, and, and I think those two things are necessary for some sort of resolution, yeah. always, in my opinion. And I think that totally applies to when we're talking about team building and, and team creation and team success. In, in the corporate world, if you're not knowing what the other person needs or how they operate or what drives them and hearing it, somebody's disgruntled. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, you just really described emotional intelligence and really understanding like what is driving everybody on your team and like what is the best way to communicate that with them. And yeah, so, so applicable. So thank thank you for sharing that. I'm not sure if this applies to you, uh, but have you gone into a team when you started working with a team that was struggling? And did you have a a time where you built that struggling team back to success? Yeah, I think um, probably my first 
team when I was in New York, they had the talent, but there were a lot of big personalities that continued to clash. So that was always hindering their success. And we just spent a lot of time on culture and building the culture and setting expectations and doing stuff that wasn't just about basketball so that mm-hmm. they could be young adults and enjoy themselves. And even when we were in season on the court, sometimes we'd have fun practices where it was just games, especially if we had like a long stretch of of hard games and hard practices, we try to break, break it up with doing something. And, you know, competition is competition. So sometimes it didn't help because we just got them more riled up. The idea and the intent was there. And that was really what turned us around for sure. Even if they were not in love with each other off of the floor, everybody knew and everybody bought into the fact that they had to stay together on the floor. And and it, it was really cool to see that happening in real time. Like they just kept getting better and better and better. And we would force the issue, right? Like we would remind them like, this is your team. You know, what happens out there, we can't, we can't play for you. That was always our phrase. We can't play for you. And if we could believe we would, <laughs> we would love to put our shoes back on and get back on the court and, you know, live, relive our glory days, but we can't. So you guys have to know, you know, you have to be the, your own coaches on the floor. We can give you the directions, but you have to be able to see it through and follow it through. And whenever you see a team take onus of that, it's just phenomenal. It, yeah it's like like the best the, the closest thing I can describe it is like if you've ever been you know a teacher or a parent and it's just like that one thing that you've been trying to get them to do and they finally do it and it's like wow <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. wow they got it it's great <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. When you talk about building culture, how did you start that? Like, how did you think about that? And then how did you start to apply that with the team? Yeah, it's funny because it's it's honestly something that I do even now when I'm in my current career as a, as, excuse me, a, a fitness coach, financial fitness coach. Anywhere I go, I'm always trying to make sure that we know each other outside of the one main goal or main purpose or main mission, right? Like mm-hmm. we call it team building if we're in the professional world. Well, honestly, that's what we used to call it when, when I was coaching as well. Um, team building, culture building, and and thinking of and brainstorming activities that would be fun and enjoyable and would actually get people involved. And that that's always been something like, when I was at the school I worked for in New York, we did, one of the first things I implemented was we would do team dinners. And my head coach, she would always host one for the holidays. And then I started doing one on my own just for them to you know, have their own space with me, but with themselves. Um, and another opportunity to eat something other than food from the calf, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, and, <laughs> and go somewhere other than their dorms. And then we did uh, back then soul cycle was like huge, huge, huge. Everybody was doing, everybody knew about it and they would offer free team rides. So if you came in with your team, yeah. they let your own team ride. So we signed them up for a soul cycle and some of them loved it. Others hated it, but it was, you know, something to joke about, laugh about, talk about, before practice the next day, after practice the next day, and and so on and so forth. Whenever we had long trips to away games, if there was a player's family in the area, we try to plan to either stop before there and have dinner with them or afterwards. Um, and being in New York, even though we were a little outside of the city, we had a lot of inner city kids. I had never seen anything besides concrete. Um, so one of our team our players had a a farm and so some of these girls had never seen farm animals in person so oh, they're wow. like or just specific type of bugs like I remember one of, my, one of my players was like coach it's a cockroach it's a giant cockroach and I'm like no that's called a grasshopper oh my gosh it's a grasshopper <laughs> you know, but, yeah it's all what you're used to so yeah uh, doing little things like that you know like I, I still have some of my players talking about that that memory those moments and, and they had um a, a tiny 
a miniature pony that they were all trying to <laughs> trying to ride. Aww. So yeah, there's and then even now, like with my current team at the Bullfinch Group, we do um bowling nights, we try to, you know, do happy hours, you know, different things that will make sure that you know, it, it's more than just crunching numbers and and trying to get clients to trying to hit the bottom line. You know, like we're all in this together. We're all working together, and and like let's remind each other of that and and, and pat each other on the back and and remember we're doing good even if it doesn't feel like it. Yeah. Do you have people either with the Bullfinch Group or with your teams that were so against? team building activities that you had to address it or do you feel like people it just like you know they had to come as a team and they were just going to accept it and like it or not did you have you had a conversation like that with anybody no actually to be honest with you I I think especially for my my um girls my young women in college they were so happy to be doing something other than yeah work or you know even if it wasn't something they wanted to do they were okay with getting out yeah but that I'm I'm sure if it ever did happen it would have just been like there would have had to be some type of threat (laughs) to be (laughs) honest which again I think is you know kind of unique to the sports world yeah yeah definitely right like I can't threaten you to come to happy hour with me (laughs) the threat of suicides like no that's not gonna work yeah yeah I'm curious because I I mean I've never had that happen although I could always tell there were some people that were a little disgruntled and they mm-hmm. came along anyway. And then, you know, they're the ones that ended up having the most fun when we did it. <laughs> but yeah, it's, I, I, I just, uh, it's good, it's good to tell people out there, don't give up on team building activities. Cause I, I think, I honestly think they're so important. Mm-hmm. And if it's just one thing's not working out, there are so many different things that you can try out and do that might work for your team. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in the, you know, the virtual world too, right? Like, yeah. I think that's, that's, what's been huge for, for me, even though our office is based in Boston and I'm based in Rhode Island. So yes, it's nice if I can get in person, but that's not the only way that we do things together so that people like myself that are hour away, hour plus, we can still feel connected. And I always encourage people to think of and and research different ways like virtual trivia night like you know so many people got so creative on the different things that you can do virtually um so yeah oh nice and you mentioned um working with head coach has that always been easy or have you had times where you didn't necessarily see eye to eye and how did you handle that when that happened Great question. Um, no, it has not always been easy. And the 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 thought as an assistant coach is like the the thought when you're a, some sort of client facing, the customer is always right, right? Your mm-hmm. head coach is always right. Um, that's num- rule number one. Even if there is something that you feel they're vehemently wrong on, you know, you can't you push the envelope to a certain extent and then you got to let it drop and know that you log it in the back when you have your own program or when you have your own time to explain it or, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of dealing with it, for the most part, I would say I kind of defaulted to that rule number one, but I felt like the longer I was working for someone, the more I was developing, the harder it was to default to that. And I think you see that in in a lot of areas, but I didn't know that that's what was happening at the time because I felt, I still felt so unsure about my talents and my skills. Like I knew I was, good at what I was doing, but I didn't feel ready to have my own program. So I think I stayed longer under somebody than I should have. And it wasn't until I could step back from where I left that role and realize like, oh, that's what that was. It was 
my body, my mind trying to tell me like, you're ready. This is like, this is, you hit your ceiling and it, and it's manifested in a lot of head bumping and, and, and a lot of toe stepping and not on purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, you want the best for your, your team. You want the best for your coach. You want the best for everybody involved, but that's what it, that's how it manifests, whether you like it or not, you know? Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think that's so important because actually, I think in a lot of conversations that I have with people on the show, we talk about being able to voice your, find your voice and speak up for what what you need, want, are ready for. And it's interesting to kind of have that um, identifier, like people can think about like if they're having that internal struggle, maybe it's really time for them to rethink, you know, is this, is where they're at, where they should be, or do they need to make a career move or, or ask for something, ask for something different. I, I appreciate that, that you, you brought you bringing that up. Yeah, thanks. I, I think, you know, we, we are programmed to just go, 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 go. And it, it's, there's, it's almost stigmatized to take a break unless it's vacation, but like, mm-hmm. don't let, don't take too much vacation because then like, what are yeah. you working for? You know, yeah. but there's power in being able to, to give yourself space and time to answer those questions. Because if I was able to, if I wasn't stigmatizing that on my own, I would have been able to, right. Cause other people were saying, maybe this is what's happening. Ah, like probably not, probably not, probably not. Right. Like I just got to keep pushing it, it. I'm just having a day or I'm having a month or whatever it is, you know, like and never even let those, the possibility of me outgrowing my position seep in to my conscious mind because I was so sure that that's not what it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And can you, is there a time when you had to make a really tough decision that affected the entire team? Maybe it was, I don't know, I could guess that maybe what those would be, but I'll let you answer that question. If if anything has happened, how, how did you deal with that or recover from it? Tough decision. Um, a lot of ways to answer the question. That's why I'm pausing. Yeah. <laughs> um, hmm, let's see. There have been moments in practice or in a game where um, I felt like what we were doing was incorrect or should be improved. And this is an, when I was an assistant coach. And the, one of the things I would never want to do is to have the team see me challenging the head coach in front of them, right? At the mm-hmm. end of the day, no matter how I feel or don't feel, we have to be a united front. And so there was there was one specific time where it was during a game and uh, I had tried to communicate that we needed to make a change and it wasn't received well. And I pushed a little more than I should have, not in any way that was noticeable, but the aftermath was noticeable because then there was no longer any communication for the rest of the game. Yeah. And so, and the, the consequence was, you know, we were a team. So half the team was not, able to help out and bounce each other, bounce each other, bounce ideas off of each other. And our actual team suffered for that because Mm -hmm. we weren't able to communicate effectively and we weren't able to be a united front and push whatever we were feeling about it aside and focus on the, the, the ultimate goal. And that, that was the one time it happened. It never happened again because it, it, and we lost that game, of course, <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> that's like obviously I was assuming. The, yeah, the moral of the story. And you just feel horrible. Like, oh my, like put the personal stuff aside. Like you got to be able to find a way to stay focused and not sweat the small stuff, which is easier said than done. 
after the fact, right? Hindsight is twenty twenty. But I also think that things, sometimes things like that have to occur for you to remember or readjust to what's important. Um, you know, like it, it sometimes sucks to say, but challenges make us stronger, you know, like resilience comes from, yeah. from pain and, and unfortunate circumstances. So definitely in that case, you know, there, and so many others where I'm like, Oh, I'm never going to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> and I need, I wouldn't be able to say that had I not been through it or made that mistake. Yeah. That's so interesting because I'm just thinking about how, you know, when you're in the game and something like that happens, it is such, it's even more significant because there's only so much time and there's a one outcome that comes out of that. Whereas you have more time when you're in the corporate world wow. where it's, there's not as like significant of an impact. If you take a day or two, you guys both think about it, you kind of come back together but when you're there on the court, like this is an immediate impact and you're either going to win the game or lose the game because something like that happens. Like, so it's interesting to, to think about that. It's just very high pressure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With all the things that we've talked about, what are the things that you've taken from being a coach and what have you brought into your current business of being your financial fitness coach? Like, are there things that you learned along the way that really have helped you in your current role or that you feel have benefited you? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I think the, the interpersonal skills I learned with working with so many different personalities and, and, and like you coined the emotional intelligence that you I think have to be well-versed in to, to be successful dealing with young people, dealing with humans in general, but especially young people, that those are the two that I, are at the forefront of my mind. Because I, when I'm talking to a client, um, especially since it's about money, you know, it, most people are coming to me uncomfortable. Yeah. And if I can't get them in a space where they're comfortable they're not going to trust me. We're not going to be able to get anything done and they're going to feel worse for that. And that makes me cringe, right? Like yeah. if somebody's trying to do something right for themselves, I owe it to them to make sure that I help them show up in a way where they can succeed. And the same, I, the same, you know, feeling of joy that I would get when I've taught a girl a move and she finally did it in the game is the same amount of joy I get when, you know, we've created a budget and somebody was able to like my, in my first year, I had a client that was able to completely get debt free. And I like jumped through my roof when she called me, you know, like this, I think of my clients as my players in the sense that I'm coaching them to succeed and any win for them is a win for me and is a win for us. Wow. Oh, oh. I can see where that would make you feel really good, especially, I mean, I, hopefully that doesn't like go away. I know you're kind of new, like three, three years into being, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully you continue to find that joy working with, with people. I think some people over time get desensitized to that and might get a little jaded and like, why aren't you listening to me? And, you know. Yeah. And honestly, that's a good point. And, and I think what, what I, even in my short time of, of doing this, I've realized that if that is the, if there is so much friction, then either this is not the right time for you or I'm not the right person for you. Yeah. Right. And because otherwise it may take a little longer, you know, like I always check in with people when, because life is life be life in, right. As I love to say, like life happens and you have no idea what's going on in somebody else's life, even when they're telling you most of their life. Right. So when, if I have a client that seems super committed and, and then after a month it's radio silence in the beginning, I used to take it personal and, you know, I would be trying so hard to get in touch with them 
but not for their sake, for my own, because mm -hmm. I didn't want to lose a client, right? Where now it's like, okay, something's probably happening. Let's make sure they're okay, number one. Number two, let's make sure that um, if they are okay, how can I help? And number three, like, what is our next step? And I, I found that that rarely means that we're like cutting ties because it's not working out. It's just a kicking the can down the road, like, you know, this and this and this is happening. Okay, great. So is it helpful if we plan to meet again in three months? Oh my God, yes, you would do that for me. That's awesome. Thank you. You know, so it's like, they know I'm not giving up on them. I'm here for them when they're ready. But definitely the, the it's, and I don't know if it's true for you too. Like it's, it's, I think the longer you're in business, the more you figure out what your type of person is, mm -hmm. you know, your ideal client, not just necessarily in monetary value, but in personality and character yeah. traits. And the more you're able to stick to that, it's easier to say, Ooh, like this might be, you might be a great um, profile, right? Economic profile, financial profile, but I don't want with every, whatever, whatever else comes with it. Right. And I used to think about that and do that when I was recruiting for college, I had some girls that were just phenomenal, like dogs on the court, like a coach's dream, Yeah. but their attitude was horrible, horrible. And you had to weigh the pros and cons like, okay, I'll get all this talent, but how much is that going to affect the culture of my team or yes. how much more am I going to have to work on her and sometimes it's worth it sometimes it's definitely worth it but sometimes it's definitely not <laughs> yeah yeah and that that is also true to hiring people I mean you have people that are just so experienced and have exactly what you need but then their personality you're just like oh don't know that this is going to work out with the rest of the team and how is that going to affect, because it's the same thing, like how is this person going to affect the team as a whole? And if you can't win on one person, well, you usually can't win on one person alone. Right. So it's just, uh, this is so important. And I wanted to say that, you know, definitely plug for you as a financial advisor because, um, or fi financial fitness coach, I like that term a lot better because so many people that you know have approached me specifically don't have that mentality and in fact somebody interviewed me recently i think it was a kind of a disguised interview they asked me like what was the most important thing that you look for in working with a financial advisor and for me it was like i want to enjoy working with that person i want to feel comfortable with them i i you know it, it that relationship is more important I mean, obviously you want them to know what they're doing, but mm -hmm. the relationship is so important. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. That I I I in a perfect world, all of my clients feel like we're in a, a um a long standing relationship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Who have you had a mentor in your career and who who was that and how did they affect your career? So currently, uh, and as a financial fitness coach, I have had introductions to a couple. I can't say that I found like that one mm -hmm. yet, but I, I I am blessed to have a lot of senior advisors that have a wealth of knowledge that I can always, you know, talk to for different things. But you know, having having that that one mentor that you can lean on hasn't manifested yet. And I think that's more so because I've started to do things differently, you know, like a little outside the box, a little outside the norm. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit harder, but when I was coaching my, my biggest mentor was probably my own college coach because she knew me very well. I played for her for three years. And then even though she left my senior year, we still kept in touch. She came, you know, for my senior game. And when I graduated, I went down to her house and we had dinner together. And every year, um, you know, when I got my first job, 
she came out to see me coach. And so every time there was something that was happening and she had actually, when I, when um, she left my school, she left coaching, mm -hmm. but she had coached for so long before that, you know, her, her, the knowledge was endless and it, it with X's and O's, but also, you know, with dealing with the kids and dealing with the other people on staff as well. Um, to the point where we, even though now I'm not in coaching, we still keep in touch. Like I, I now have an almost two-year-old and she's met him and mm -hmm. she knows my husband. And so that's, you know, she's near and dear. Trisha O'Brien, I call her T.O.B. for, for short. Um, near and dear to my heart. I love that woman to, to, to pieces. And she's been a, a major part in a lot of my decision-making in general, you know, and yeah. she was one of the people I talked to when I was thinking about leaving coaching since she also did the same. And it's just been a really, really, really strong North star for me, for sure. Thank you. I love hearing those mentorship stories where there has been that connection and that influence in that way. I know we're kind of running out of time, but I have a few little quick questions that yeah. I'll, I'll ask. I, I like to ask all, all of my guests. The first is when you need a little energy boost, is there, or a little bit, bit of confidence, is there a song that you'll typically go to, to put on? Oh, yes. There's so many though. <laughs> <laughs> Music is, uh, I, I, we are, we are, uh, Mus musical family so it, it can be anything from like some Beyonce mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. or um hmm, Jasmine Sullivan as well yeah. Jasmine Sullivan are, is there a song for either one so love on top for Beyonce is definitely love on top okay. one of the it's like super light, super bubbly, and you can't help yourself but like sing it at the top of your lungs. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. So Beyonce comes up a lot, but that went, but not that song. So, <laughs> and Jasmine Sullivan, I'm not familiar with. So, oh, Jasmine I, Sullivan uh, is just, she is. I love her. I, I'd like to say she's my spirit animal. <laughs> okay. I'm going to check her out. Yeah. Check, Maybe her out, check her out. Offline. You can share like one, you know, one or two songs that I should check out of hers. Is there a morning or evening routine that you rely on to kind of maintain your well-being, your sanity, your <laughs> ability to make it through the day? Yeah, that's honestly a great question for, because that's been something that I've been focusing on and always wanting to say yes to. I think having a routine is super important, but again, it's gotta be something that works for you and moving through that and being okay with adjusting. So I feel like it, I think it probably took me a, just about three years to come to a routine that works for me, large in part because my son has made me, forced me into a morning person. Yeah, kids <laughs> will do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, I, I, after I drop him off at daycare, I meditate, I do some yoga and sometimes I, I journal with a couple, a cup of tea in the morning or uh, try to, to jot some things down at night. And I noticed, you know, that that's officially my routine because I haven't been able to do it for the past couple of weeks. And I feel like I'm floating somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it does make you feel that way when you start, you know, you get out of it for a few days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, skip a few, just to kind of close out the discussion, because I know we're out of time. Is there one piece of advice or inspiration you would leave with the audience before you go and then after that if listeners want to reach out to you if you're okay with them reaching out to you how do they find you yeah okay so we'll start with the advice and inspiration the piece of advice I would give is to we'll keep it simple and think about never giving up I think especially in the world of entrepreneurship and even you know if you're if you're not working for yourself or you're working for somebody else we are scared when things change mm -hmm. even if they're changing for the better and i think that that fear can totally paralyze us in ways 
that we can see and in ways that we can't see. Mm. And, and one of the ways that we can see is us changing course and stopping whatever that was because it's too scary if it doesn't work out or if it does work out. But normally that miracle or that breakthrough or that white whale, whatever, you know, the, the goal is, is right over that fear, right past that fear, right under that fear. And it's, it's beautiful on the other side, if you can get yeah. there, but it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you keep telling yourself, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. And somebody else out there is doing the same thing. And, and, and we all can utilize leaning on each other for support because again, we never know what anybody else is going through. And even if it looks like somebody has everything in the world, they're probably still struggling with the same things you're struggling with. Yeah. So true. Very and true. then how can people find me? I am on LinkedIn as Kia Minor. I am on Facebook and Instagram for finance as Money Matters with Kia. And then if you want to find me personally, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> That's my married name, Kia Newton, on of the other socials. Kia New Newton, N-E-W-T-O-N? N-E-W-T-O-N, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kia. I appreciate the time and all of this, uh, all these stories and all the perspective that you've given. It applies to so many different things, life, corporate being on the court, mm -hmm. being an entrepreneur. I mean, I think anybody listening is going to be able to get so much value out of this conversation. So I really appreciate you sharing and coming on. And I look forward to talking with you again. Thank you so much, Michelle. I really, really appreciate you having me. It was so much fun. Yeah, same here. Well, have a great day. You too. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Hi, everyone. This is Michelle again. If you enjoyed this conversation, hit subscribe so you don't miss out on our weekly episodes. And if you're really feeling it, please leave a review. We'd love to have your support. You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter where we share things we're excited about, things we found funny or inspiring, and must-read leadership videos and articles we came across that week. You can subscribe by going to www.thebosstrack.com forward slash weekly joy. That's www.thebosstrack.com forward slash weekly joy. Drop in your email and you'll get the very next one. Thanks for listening.